We are here at San Japan 2010 with Josh Greeley. Josh, I interviewed you for my documentary Cosplayers of the Movie yes. a year ago. How have things been for you since then? Well, they've been, uh, I'll take that from you. Uh, they've, been, they've been very well so far. Uh, can't really complain. And uh, to steal, uh, uh, steal a line from Christopher Ayers, uh, can't complain that even if I could, nobody wants to hear, so I don't bother. Uh, been working on a lot, of, uh, a lot of shows for Funimation and a few things for Sentai Filmworks and Seraphim Studios, uh, formerly known as, as ADV Films. Uh, they closed down. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. That really sucks. Yeah. You tell me about it, it. It happened like right after I interviewed you, too. You were talking yeah. about uh, all the internet piracy and stuff that's going on and how it was really hurting the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, one of the big companies that you worked for, they closed down right after that. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, <clears throat> Whether or not it's it's getting better or getting worse, I, I really can't say. Uh, all I know is uh, that people are that the, the, it's still a major problem. I, I still I do know that still some the surviving studios are still getting hurt pretty bad by it or taking a hit. And although they're doing everything that they can to try to please the fans and get them stuff faster, get them stuff cheaper, get them stuff uh, in a variety of different ways that they can obtain it. They're it's the internet now, right? They're yeah. really trying to focus on the internet. Yeah, they they really are. Uh, I mean, prime example. Full, I'm, I believe it's. I, I, I'm thinking they did it for Brotherhood, for Phone Lock West Brotherhood, that we're having the episode and for One Piece, they're having the new episodes come out fully subtitled in English on their webs on their website, uh, the Funimation channel on YouTube, and I believe Hulu. Uh, literally either within a day of it being broadcast or the day it's broadcast in Japan. Right, because I've been watching actually the Full Metal mm -hmm. Brotherhood. You know, I just watched the final episode yeah. the other day and I was like, wow, it was so awesome. Yeah. And you can watch this stuff, you know, for free now with, well, you know, the yeah. mid-rolls play, that's how they mm -hmm. generate their ad revenue. Yeah. Is that uh, a model that's working for them now? I really couldn't say. Uh, <clears throat> again, I am I only ever really see the production side of things. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm in a dark little booth with headphones on and screaming into a microphone. But uh, I know that a lot, I know at the very least that more and more people are getting the message and understanding what's going on and under, and what kind of hurt this is really putting on the industry. Uh, I think one of the best things that they have going for them right now is aside from aside from the fact that they're streaming their stuff on by themselves like the YouTube channels and Hulu and stuff like that. I think one of the greatest things we have going for us right now is is, is uh, Crunchyroll. Now that it has gone fully legit, and you can either watch it for free with advertisements or you can pay a monthly fee, and and get it without advertisements and high quality. And I I can't even I don't even know how many shows are on there. I just know that there's a lot. There's a lot. I, there's a ton of stuff. I mean I've I've I actually I, I go to Crunchyroll a lot myself to check out new stuff whenever, whenever they get it. Uh, what's that? That I can't remember the name of the show, uh, at the moment. But if I, if I think of it, I'll I'll toss it out. I know out, they but... just got a single cast of Bleach. Uh, the really. New, the new episodes for Bleach. They've got uh, Hitman Reborn. Mm -hmm. uh, what else did I watch on there? Uh, I haven't really been watching the sports stuff mm -hmm. or the J dramas, but uh, I've been watching. There's that. fairy t fairy tale. I like fairy tale a lot. I've I haven't seen fairy tale. I've heard a lot of it. Though. It's really I've good. Heard the fairy tale is really good. I was watching Kanemimo, which was I thought was hilarious. It was adorable, especially just this what that like the second or third episode where it they just turned it into a full on musical. I thought it was great. It's hilarious. I haven't even, I haven't finished it yet, but. Uh, and uh, I know that they've got even some stuff that was older that hasn't that hasn't been released over here, like Pretty Cure. They got Pretty Cure and stuff on there. Uh, but that is is something I think is a very strong and very uh, advantageous thing, it, especially both for the fans and for the industry, because you keep people, uh, especially with you know for those that pay the subscriptions, all those proceeds go back to the Japanese companies in that those shows belong to, to enable them to create more content. And that's really what the entire thing is about, is, you know, if if you're a fan of something, by definition, the very core of the meaning of the word fan, you support an artist or a genre of something with your, with financially, 
so that as, as, as an appreciation and as a thank you, you, you support it financially so that that person can make more of the content that you can then enjoy. And it's, that's, it's, that's the two-way cycle. And I think the term fan has kind of become uh, obscured and, and kind of uh, bastardized, if you will, uh, thinking with this whole mindset of, I'm a fan of this, I like it, therefore I deserve it. So I'm just gonna take it. It's there, it's free, and, and I'm a fan of it, therefore, you know, it's, it's mine. I, and and this no instant them, gratification, yeah. There's no way for them to generate the revenue to exactly. make more of these shows, you know. These are not something they do as a part-time you know, yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. These are full-time jobs. They yeah. have families, you know, they mm -hmm. got to support and produce this content for people to, you know, watch this entertainment. Exactly. And if they're not getting money back to make more and, you know, you know feed their families and stuff, yeah. there's just not going to be any more. Like, Nabashin, Shinichi Watanabe, uh, two years ago, had to make a choice because there was no more work for him. He had to make a choice between whether to buy a pack of cigarettes or buy diapers for his baby. And that, that's how tight money. That's that's how tight. That's how tight money got for him. It's, I'm, thankfully, I've, I've heard. I believe he's got another project going under his belt. And but another thing is, most of the of the the hardcore and, and the incredibly famous and talented Japanese directors and creators that have been making anime for so long are leaving and going to video games and other stuff like that because there's still money to be made there. There's still a market there. They can continue to make a living and, you know, not be homeless. Um, there was also, I know, what was it? There was a press release not too long ago about, uh, like, earlier this year. Talk about Bane Zoom? Oh yeah, well the Bang Zoom press release that was like what two months ago? Yeah, it wasn't too long ago. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago, but also earlier this year, or it was either the the end of last year or the beginning of this year, there was an announcement that Gonzo is now existing in like name only at oh, this geez, point Gonzo? because Gonzo is down to they laid off. They had already done a massive layoff of animators right. and stuff, but then either it was like again it was either the last quarter of last year or the beginning of this year they laid off an, another fifty, I believe, animators. They're down to a scale, to a skeleton crew. There's there's animators no longer they no longer have a office. But they used to have two offices, one in, uh, one near Tokyo, I believe, and another one was in Narima. And Narima was this was their really small little office that really wasn't much of anything and a friend of mine went over there actually for a tour I believe it was Sammy Inouye Hart I believe was over there and she was just there for a weekend and she was going to get a tour of both studios she ended up missing uh because her plane had gotten in late had missed the first tour they were going to do her uh, show her for the, their primary headquarters studio and ended up just sleeping that night and was going to do the interview the next day. When she got up the next morning, there was no more Tokyo office. It was just the one in Narima. That's, it, it was, it just, out like that. That sucks. Like, uh, yeah. Gonzo was creating some of the most original, you know, yeah, not, just based, not just based on manga, but, you mm -hmm. know, original stuff. Gonzo's been... And really pushing, you know, the animation techniques, yeah. you know, into the 21st, 22nd century. Yeah, they, and, they were going hardcore into it. They were producing several shows a year by themselves, just, just cranking them out. And now they're down to, I think, two or three shows per season. That's, that's just sucks. It's, that's, it's just kind of the, the way things are going at this point. Uh, it's uh, again going back to what we were saying it's it's when you don't have that two-way connection when it, when it's not fan and creator both you know having a, having, having a, a symbiotic relationship with each other and it's just people taking 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 and not giving anything back you're not a fan you're a leech and it's suck and we there's so many leeches out there right now it's sucking the life out of the anime industry and where we'll be in two three years is anybody's guess at this point? Again, where you know we try to get the word out as much as possible, and get so at least put it into perspective for people. And if there's always going to be those people out there that don't care, I've met several of them. Don't care. They're proud of the fact that they that they steal and that they are hurting the industry. That just the fact that they got it first or got it free is all they care about. But there are the true fans that do care about it and 
need to know and need to do whatever they can. And I and I know so many feel like you know they're powerless when they actually when it when it all comes into perspective, and they're not. One person is all it takes to start spreading the word, start telling their friends, start telling, start posting on forums, or just doing what they can. Buy the stuff that you like, and hopefully we'll still have a a, uh, a working anime industry in the next you know three to five years. So. Uh... Can you give us a little bit of insight into the localization process? Because yeah, I know you talk about this a lot at your panels, you know, about uh, how exactly the translation happens, the scripts and so forth, mm -hmm. and why, like, sometimes there's cultural differences that yeah. aren't as, you know, explainable to, you know, people who aren't familiar right. with Japanese audiences. Okay. Um, well, like, for me, I, I also work in ADR script writing. What that means is there's, by the time... I start working on a script for an episode, a translation has already been made, and it's gone through the translation process, which is usually goes through a team of about three to five translators uh, to make sure that everything is as close as it can be to, uh, to conversational English translation. Um, unfortunately, no, you, you'll never get a raw translation because... While it might be easy to just get a raw translation, a good translator will know, will also understand cultural differences even within different regions of Japan. What something would be uh, would mean, what a what reference they're making to, you know, either making fun of a pop culture uh, thing over there or of a celebrity or anything like that, and will give us those notes in the translation they send, saying this is this is the most. This is the most English equivalent or American equivalent translation to what this means, and then they'll have like a two-page long history of what uh, of what they're actually referencing in Japan. That's because, you know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of their jokes and animes, like mm -hmm. it's very cultural. Oh yeah. And if you did a raw translation, a lot of it would be lost. Right. The the context, because most people watch, especially if it's a show for like kids, like One Piece, mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to understand the reference to something that's. Uh, exclusive to the Japanese culture, so right. in order to retain the intended humor of the scene, you know, they have to change it to some, something that's relevant to American culture. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what, I mean, what it really boils down to is whether you're, whether we're doing the translation, ADR script, directing, producing, any of that, the primary, the core of the process, the core goal is that we are caretakers of these shows, that it is our job to stick to as close as possible to the original intent of the creator's vision for that title, for that property. Uh, primary example, I would say, uh, would be Nerima Daikon Brothers that uh, Chris, Christopher has directed for the English dub. He and Nabashin are very close friends, and he knows, Chris knows, that uh, Nabashin's primary intent with anything that he does is to make you laugh. Or to make you laugh and cry when it gets to the end of his shows. Um, and there were a few jokes, like in Wallflower, for example, there was a joke that was made in, in one of the episodes where Greg Ayer's character, Yuki, is uh, is doing, uh, is very thoroughly enjoying a popsicle. And he, as he's eating the popsicle, he's humming the tune to a Japanese jingle. A, just a commercial jingle. If you had a hundred people that, f if you had just a, a room full of people that thoroughly understood, in America, that understood Japanese culture and, and references, maybe five people would have gotten that, would have actually, would have gotten that joke. Out of a hundred people, I'd say maybe five, five to ten max, would actually understand what that is referencing. And we could have stuck with the original, we could have stuck with, you know, just Greg copying that jingle. But again, Nabashin's intent is to make you laugh. Right, it's, funny. it's supposed to be funny, and he wants to go for. And we we contacted him and said, "Look, this uh, this isn't working. Uh, what would you like for us to do with it?" And he said, "Just go with whatever you feel. We get the bigger laugh." And so instead of comping that jingle, Yuki's character now using the popsicle is is humming, what would you do for a popsicle? What would you do for a popsicle? Parody, yeah. yeah, parroting one of our own jingles. Right. And then right there, you broaden the under you broaden the audience that would get that joke and you've still kept the intent. That's 
in a nutshell, what we do, what what the job is, is to bring it into a into a format into conversational English where it can be understood and it can reach the broadest audience. It's, it's mo so that the broadest audience can understand and appreciate it, and that's that's really it. Thank you so much, Josh. Always a wonderful uh, interview. So much information. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, San Japan 2010, Josh Greeley. Should be here. Are you gonna be here like next year? You're all, you're almost always here, aren't you? I've been here. I've been here all three years so far, and again, it's been it's been amazing to see how much this convention has grown. To see, uh, especially, uh, it's it's especially touching to me because this this was the first town that I ever moved in. I ever moved to after graduating high school from my little hometown in Central Texas, and was a really accepting, very warm, welcoming place. And San Japan brought something that is incredible and that needed to, to be here. And first, they brought it to San Antonio, and now seeing how much it's matured and grown and that it's remained such a shining example of professionalism and perfection and just overall fun for the kids and for us, uh, they've brought something great to the country. I would say it's it's one of my favorite shows to do, and as long as they invite me back, I'll keep coming. I will forever keep coming to this convention as long as they invite me back, as long as they can stand me, I'll keep coming back. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. it. 2010, San Japan. Be here next year, Josh Greeley. Thank <laughs> you.